context as, as part of the answer. The, the, the Triple H money is, is basically earmarked for a specific type of housing. And yes, it is expensive. Uh, it is permanent supportive housing. And as I said, that is not for everybody who's homeless. That is mainly for people who are chronically homeless. That, that, that's a term <coughs> that means that they have been homeless for over a year and a half or two years, long time homeless with some form of disability. They're, 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 but, 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 well, but yes, because that's what you asked about. So uh, and I'll, I'm going to answer the full question. But, but, but you asked about the $500,000 per unit. So for that type of housing, it is expensive because it comes with all the wraparound services, it comes with staff on site, and it is long term. And because of federal rules, most of that has to be single person per unit. Federal rules. So, but that is not the solution for everybody. Now that solution, for that population is the most effective solution anybody has ever found in the country to chronic homelessness. I grant you that. It, so uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to answer. I'm talking about for the next three to six I, nine months. I, I understand. But you, uh, you asked multiple questions, so I need to give you multiple answers. So you asked about the cost of the 500000 so I want to explain what that is. Then the, the other 75% of the homeless population, we need the other solutions, like the things I've been talking about quicker rental subsidies, bridge housing, a whole range of different things which are significantly less expensive and should be faster. I'm trying to push those into the system. There's a lot of resistance to something that isn't building something big and new. As for the desert idea, I actually don't support the idea. One, because I think it is, uh, it, it, it's a false promise because it isn't going to happen. But, but it's, it's, it's the question I get all the time, is why aren't we building housing for you know, three, 4,000 people out in the desert? Well, I'll tell you, every single project I have done, with the exceptions of the one in Delray and West LA, uh, in, in all the other neighborhoods I have done, people have rose up in opposition. And I'm not alone. The same thing has happened to every single one of my colleagues. Anywhere you try to build anything, there is pushback. And I don't see any universe in the world when you see what every other city is doing where they are going to willingly say, yes, Los Angeles, please import 5,000 homeless people. How about federal land? How about working with the federal government to get some We have been trying very hard to work on the VA property. I'm talking about $5,000 tents that are nice to live in, that were perfectly good for people to live in. And the federal government. Not $500,000. And the federal government, respectfully has declined us. Right now, we have the sprawling VA campus, which should be used to house our veterans, particularly our homeless veterans. The, we are building a big tent there to house people. The city is paying for it, and the county is paying for it, and the city is building it, because the federal government hasn't and won't. There's a lot of stuff the federal government can do, and our senator and our representatives have a bill in Congress, but it can't get through the Senate, and we need it to. Yes, sir. By the way, we have time for this question only. This is the last one. Okay. I'm going to be short, short enough. I just wanted to get your comments on a uh, factor that I think also plays a very important role in this is why we have an explosion of people who live on the street, and that is the uh, district, the Ninth District Court decision that was brought down a couple of years ago. said, oh, well, what are we gonna, this is a very destructive law, we don't like it, it doesn't help. They gave instructions to the proper parts of the city, of the government, and for example, in Modesto, take a park that was unused, install tents, provide housing, comply with the law, and enforce the law against squatting on the sidewalk. And in addition, they, uh, they appe they're, they're appealing that law. They don't like that law. And I think most people in this in the city of Los Angeles, when it's explained to them, do not think that law is a good law. But what you guys did, you saw the law and you said, okay, we're going to
going to set up provisions for where you're allowed to camp on the street. Conveniently, Pacific Palisades, you can't camp on the street in very many places. Mar Vista, where I'm very familiar, you can camp on the street right in where the farmer's market is. <coughs> and people hate it. And there's, well, I don't want to talk too much. Yeah, yeah, in the interest of time, what's the question? Yeah, the question. Why did the city appeal that decision? And two, how did you come up with these rules about where you are allowed to camp that are directly responsible for the explosion of people camping in public? So the, our city attorney does want to appeal the decision. Uh, I agree with Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, and I oppose that decision to appeal the decision. Uh, I don't think that the decision is the reason we have people who are homeless. Uh, I, I gave you a whole list of reasons that people who are homeless. I mean, there's, there's, there's 40, 50 reasons that people who are homeless. That, that court re decision did not make anybody homeless. What the court decision says is you either give somebody a place to stay or you can't tell them they can't sleep outdoors, which is, while it is difficult for cities, it is a fairly reasonable proposition. When the city got its own version of that lawsuit back in 2006, the city reacted by saying, okay, we, if we have to give people a right to housing or a right to the sidewalk, the city back in 2006, it will give them a right to the sidewalk. That's why we have the problem. It's not the court decision. It's our, it's our, it's our, it's our boneheaded uh, response to it. Now, right now, there are people who want to appeal this decision. And they say, we need every tool in the book to help us save these, these, these poor souls on the street. I do not see how legislating not sleeping helps anybody get off the street. It's, it, they're, they're, all of my colleagues are tripping over themselves to be the law and order candidate, and they're giving you a false solution. You cannot legislate your way out of ho uh, homelessness. You can house your way out of homelessness, you can prevent your way out of homelessness, you can serve your way out of homelessness, but you can't legislate your way out of it. So uh, there are people, some of my colleagues and folks at the, the County Board of Supervisors who are saying, oh my God, they're telling us we have to offer everybody a, a, a bed to sleep in. And they say, oh my God, that is so hard, that is so expensive. So, well, yes it is, but, 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 what, what, but what, is, what is hard? A government with millions and billions of dollars actually doing the right thing and providing people housing, or someone who does not have a place to stay being penalized for not sleeping in a bed that we have not provided. And that's the, the, the choice we're trying to make. Doing what Modesto did. They saw, they saw, I mean, obviously, Modesto is not Los Angeles, but Los Angeles has more resources. Provide cheap place to, for them to stay with law enforcement, with sanitation. We're, we're getting cholera. We, we are all trying, and if you have another location where I can put permanent supportive housing, or bridge housing, uh, or, or services, no, I am happy to do it. Just please happy to do it. Camp, but not on Venice Boulevard. Thank you, folks. We have, we've got to talk about this for hours and days, <laughs> etc. So, Mike, thank you so much. This is fantastic. Next speaker is Heidi Marston. I suspect that many of you aren't aware of her background. She is, uh, as I said before, uh, a really important part, a person in this whole process. Um, by the way, before I forget, if anybody has an interesting idea or is interested in what Mike was talking about, finding a place in the Palisades that might be possible for perhaps uh, housing women, uh, there is a new affordable housing task force. It is not part of the task force, the Palisades Homelessness Task Force, uh, but it is a separate group. Talk to me, I'll put you in touch with them because it is such a great idea. Um, Heidi is the chief program officer at LASA, and uh, in that position she oversees access and, engage access and engagement and a whole lot of other teams that uh, or a long list. Basically, she's the head of operations. She's the number two person at LASA, so we're lucky to have her here. Um, before, she started that in February 2019, not very long ago. And before that, she led the effort at the VA to end veteran homelessness in greater Los Angeles. Not an easy task, um, and we're still working on that. 
before that, she spent several uh, years, many years, in several different capacities at the VA. So um, with that quick introduction and uh, what Mike said about uh, how important her work is, I give you Heidi. Thank you. Well, luckily, Mike and I have similar slides, so I'm going to be able to go through it really quickly and then answer any questions that you have. But thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And um, I just have to say, I, I worked with the Palisades in this group a little bit when I was at the VA, but it's always so refreshing and encouraging to see community members who are willing to step up and have these conversations and be a part of the solution um, and really, truly um, want to contribute. So thank you for that and thank you for your time. I know this is a challenging issue, so we'll try to um, go through this. So I'm going to go through a couple things um, and I'll, I'll go through it pretty quickly and I'm happy to go back and, and talk about certain things that are in, of interest to you. But um, I put a few things together to help you understand what LASA is within this very large system, um, some of our core functions and how it sort of fits into this very big picture. So LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, were in joint powers between the city and the county of Los Angeles. So we report to both the city and the county. Um, and we're charged with overseeing LA County's, our entire response system to homelessness. Um, everything from street outreach to funding programs, and these are really our core functions. Um, when we say system lead, this is talking from the federal side. Um, we do receive federal funding from HUD um, for our continuum of care, and we administer that entire program. Um, we do administration of grants and services. We, we do a lot of funding for service providers and contracts. I think we have over 250 service providers that work for us in some capacity that we contract with and direct services. So we have out, about 200 outreach workers um, that work under me who are doing street outreach dir directly in partnership with our service providers who are also doing outreach. So we're doing a little bit of everything. Um, we have about $271 million that we administer in grants every year. Overall, we get about $400 million between city, county, uh, state, and the federal government that we administer. So a couple things that we don't do just so you, to help you understand. So we don't actually develop housing um, and we don't administer things like housing vouchers. We partner with the housing authorities to do that. Um, we don't provide direct services like case management other than our outreach services. That's the extent of what we do. We fund those, those actions and those entities. And we also don't operate shelter. So we administer the grants and oversee the contracts to make sure that the way we do shelter in Los Angeles is consistent um, but we don't directly provide those services. Um, so we talked a little bit about this um, when we were prepping for this, and I just wanted to, we can come back to this, but we're in the news quite a bit as LASA, um, both from the city side and the county side. I think um, LASA is very visible, particularly in our outreach function, um, because we have so many folks out there. So you may have seen us lately in the news around a city controller report, um, and I'm happy to talk to you about that, but the big thing that we want folks to take away is the city controller report really came back and said outreach workers aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not reaching their goals that were set for them by the city and the county. Um, is it really effective? Uh, their response was, we don't think so. Um, we spent a lot of time talking um, to the city controller and speaking on this report. Um, frankly, just so, and again, I'll, I can go back to this later, but I want all of you to know that the the actions and the contracts that were evaluated in this report were about two years old, um, and it doesn't reflect what our system looks like now. Um, one thing that we know with Measure H is we had this massive infusion of resources into our system. And so just like we see with our service providers, LASA um, and our system has had to really spend time building up. So you can, you can pour $200 million, $300 million into our system tomorrow, it's going to take a long time to get staffed up to that, to get everybody trained at the level they need to. So um, what this was was a reflection of what our system looked like a few years ago. There's a lot of awesome work being done now that I can talk more about later, but I just wanted to flag it for you in case you've seen it. There's more to the story and we can talk about it if you want. Um, a quick overview, and, and Mike talked about a lot of this, so I'm going to breeze through it. Um, kind of the portrait of homelessness in Los Angeles according to our last homeless count. Um, which you've seen. 
Um, you also saw, I think this is always important, I'll, I'll just hammer on it again, that everybody has this idea that, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so that Minnesota, you know, puts everybody on a bus in the winter and they ship them to Los Angeles, and that's why we have all these homeless individuals in Los Angeles, and what we see time and time again is that's just not the case. Lived here their whole life, if not for a very significant amount of time. There are neighbors, there are community members, um, there are co-workers that we might not even know. So in terms of framing, um, it's always just important to remember this piece. And, and then this is, this is used to show sort of our system flow. And, um, so what we look at here is when you see this 721,000 number at the top, this is representing severely rent burdened households in LA. That means people and households in LA County who pay more than 50% of their income on rent are classified as severely rent burdened. And what we really see is these are the people when we look at our system who are on the verge of homelessness at any given moment. They're the people who are one paycheck away, one family crisis away uh, from falling into homelessness. And so what our goal has become is not only housing those who are homeless, but making sure that these people who are at risk don't fall in in the first place. Because what we'll talk about more later is what we're starting to see is because our system is so overloaded with so many people, when you fall in, it's becoming harder and harder to actually get out because there's such a lack of resources relative to the need. So what we see, again, 721,000 rent burn kind of on the verge. Last year, we had almost 6,000 people who were prevented from, ending, from entering homelessness. So that means maybe they were on the verge of eviction. It means maybe they were behind on their rent. And rather than giving them permanent supportive housing, we were able to subsidize their rent for a couple of months so they could get a job and get back on their feet, get their income going again. So we're finding that these interventions around prevention, preventing people from falling in and diverting them from our system is faster, uh, less traumatic, and less expensive than it is to actually have somebody fall in and try to house them through whatever means we have. But this is really meant to represent the flow of homelessness. So this is what we had last year. In 2018, about 52,000 people experiencing homelessness. Throughout the course of the year, we're estimating that about 54,000, 55,000 people fell into homelessness throughout the course. Remembering that our point in time count is just that, it's one day in January, so it doesn't represent all the people that flow in and flow out. So we estimate that about 55,000 came into homelessness in 2018. We know that our system housed 21,000, more than we've ever housed before is our system, so we're doing more. And we also estimate that 27,000 people of this total were able to resolve either on their own or resolve their homelessness without some sort of subsidy from our system. What that left us was 58,000 people, 59,000 people almost uh, still experiencing homelessness. So again, we see it in our veteran population and our senior populations over and over, where essentially we, we started with 52, we house more, we did more than we have, have ever done, and we still have more people experiencing homelessness. So this is just a reminder for all of us that homelessness is dynamic. Uh, homelessness, there are a lot of people that come in and out of it, and so there are a lot of interventions, a lot of components that need to take place for people to actually come out successfully. And again, we, we talked about this a little bit too earlier, but 75% of our individuals who are experiencing homelessness are unsheltered. Um, and, but there's a lot being done. Um, a lot of people are exiting the and a lot of new interim housing beds coming on through programs like the Abridge Home Program, which has been our fastest way to bring on new interim housing. So then I heard that you guys want to talk a little bit about CES, and I'm not going to bore you, and I have some, <laughs> some flyers for you that you can bring home, but CES is something that's thrown a lot, around a lot, and it's kind of getting into the technical weeds of homelessness and how our system works. But our coordinated entry system is what we call it. And the big idea behind our coordinated entry system is that when you have as many people experiencing homelessness as we do, we want to make sure that as a system, we're being fair and equitable in how people access services and making sure that every person has equal opportunity and a fair opportunity um, to get the resources that we need. Um, I can use the VA as an example when I was there. Um, 
there is a program through the VA called the HUD Batch Program, and it's a supportive housing program uh, specifically for veterans. And what we are finding is people who are using this permanent supportive housing resource, there were thousands of people who needed it and who were eligible for it, but they weren't the sickest of the sick, they weren't the most chronic people. Um, they were the ones who are coming to our door saying, I need a housing voucher, so we would give it to them. But what we realized is that as we were just kind of sitting in place and issuing vouchers to people, that was great, but we weren't seeing a difference in our chronically homeless population. Those people who we do see have been on the streets multiple times for years and years. And what it took was us actually taking our outreach teams and going out to find those people and to engage them and to build trust with them before they ever got to a point where they said, okay, I think that maybe I can trust the system again. I think I understand what's going on and I have relationships built and now I'll take a voucher. So CES tries to take a system and find those people that can't advocate for themselves to make sure that they have just as much of an opportunity to get housing as the person who comes to the door every single day asking for it. So again, it really lays the groundwork, and it's a CES is sort of a, a term, but it's also a computer system that we use that tracks everybody who comes in contact with our system, whether it's through LASA or, or through a service provider. And again, it's about creating effective, efficient, and fair services to everybody. Um, we have these a system for each population, one for families with children, one for adults, and one for youth. The reason for that is because each of these populations requires different types of services and they all have different needs. So we need to make sure that we're tailoring experiences to those specific populations. And then I just, I like this picture because this is kind of what a system would look like. So without CES, you have everybody trying to go in through the front door and what your experience is is totally gonna vary depending on who you talk to, uh, what city you're in, um, what the resources are, who they know, um, with CES, we try to put everybody in through the same front door and filter everybody out through a similar back door and give them all equal access to the services that are available. I'm not going to go through this. We can talk about it more, um, but I want, just want to make sure we have time to answer questions. But again, this is just another picture for you. So people kind of come in through CES, so that means whether it's an outreach worker or one of our sites of care, we give you an assessment. We say, um, are, how vulnerable are you? Um, how long have you been homeless? What sort of supports do you have, if any? So the first thing we do is we assess that. And now in our system, while Mike was saying permanent supportive housing and permanent housing is always 